Well, good morning, everyone, and it is good to be back in our home church again, and thank you, Grant, for that welcome. We do kind of feel like we're always in, on the road lately, but it's all good. It's all uh, to, uh, to service uh, the churches of God and to give glory to Him. And, of course, today I'd like to bring you greetings from David Askin. He contacted us uh, this week. He, was, he got news that uh, Hene is now fellowshipping with us, and uh, he sends his greetings and his love and hopes to be up here again shortly. A lot of you would know also Carmen, who was fellowshipping with us, a good friend of ours at the early um, part of uh, this year. Um, poor Carmen's been diagnosed with leukemia. Um, we don't know what type of leukemia she's got, but it, it seems to attack her immune system. So please remember Carmen uh, in, in your prayers for us. Thank you. And of course, today is uh, history unfolds today as uh, we get ready to say thank you to all the officers that have served the church. And uh, from next Sabbath on, we've got new officers serving our church. Today is the day where I actually hand the scepter over to, uh, to Lewis Ringrose as head elder. Um, I praise the Lord that you've allowed uh, Marianne and myself and our team of elders to serve this church in that position for the last seven years. And uh, it's been a really rewarding time. hasn't always gone well, and we've disappointed one or two people on the way. For that, we're sorry. But uh, please continue to pray and support your elders of the church, the leaders of your church, your board members, so that they too will always be encouraged as the Spirit of God leads them. So again, thank you. However, you're not going to get rid of us that easy. We still remain the associates here uh, in Whangarei, and uh, we, love, we love you all. God is absolutely awesome. And as you know, there's many things happening within our churches. And uh, we had the um, coal porters go through the Kaikoui church. And, um, and it was amazing. They had made different contacts with different ones in the Kaikoui region. I think they had a sales of over $10,000 in that area. But uh, they gave me some contacts that I could go and visit. And one was a guy by the name of Thomas. And then, it's very hard, to, I don't know why, but to try and get people home in Kaikoui. It's only a small place, but everyone's busy still there. And anyway, I met up with this man, and I went to his home, and I said, excuse me, are you Thomas? And he goes, yes, you must be Gary. They said that you'd be calling around. So anyway, we made up a time to, to meet together, and unfortunately, I mucked up the first one because my first appointment took longer, and by the time I got there, he had to go uh, on another errand. Oh, sorry, take his son back to school. So then the second time I called on him, his, uh, his brother was ill. Um, he had to take him to hospital. So I said, well, can I have, a, have prayer with you in regards uh, for your brother? And he said, yep, that will be great. So we did that. The third time I met him, uh, we were able to have a study together. And it's interesting, when I first went there, the door just opened and this young child just walked away again. Came back a couple of times, went away again, came back, and then finally dad came to the door. The son is autistic, but what a lovely child. And um, it just, he just kind of represents his dad and in, in in his size and just happy to be alive type of person. Anyway, with Thomas, I took him through the, the Godhead. I like to explain the Godhead because I in, um, explain that in detail because after I've done the studies, I say the reason why I take you through this is so that you're founded on the Trinity. Founded on the Trinity because I know you're going to get a visit from some other denomination by the name of JWs. And, uh, and also he's been having fellowship with the Mormons. But he was just so impressed because as I, as I explained that to him, I said, where did we just get that information, uh, Thomas? He said, out of the Bible. I said, amen. And I said, that's the foundation for our church is the Bible, Sola Scriptura. Last week, uh, this week just gone, sorry, I was with him and I took him through Daniel 2. Daniel 2, as we all know, shows the history of the world. And again, he was blown away that we have such a beautiful message and explanation of the history of the world. And of course, that big rock is about to, to hit the earth and set up God's kingdom on earth again. He said, that is just so powerful. So I said to him, okay, Thomas, we've done two studies. Do you want to really continue this journey that we've started on through Scripture? Oh, he said, oh, yes, please. And um, so it, it's just interesting to see that people are actually hungering for the Word of God because there are so many people telling fibs out there about, uh, about Christianity. So please keep also Thomas in your prayers. 
the other day too, Mary and I had the occasion of visiting a person and, and it was amazing because uh, as we got into the conversation, this particular person said to us, why don't we keep the festivals? Why don't we keep the Passover? And I said to Marianne, I said, she wants to keep the festival. She can't even keep the Sabbath properly. Hello. Anyway, apart from that, there is, seems to be a big phenomenon moment, at the moment going through, through the world, but also through our churches about this re, re-establishment of keeping the festivals. And uh, so I kind of did a little study and I put a, f- a few slides together in regards to it. But when you look at all the festivals and look at everything that took place in the sanctuary service, it all pointed to one person and one person only, to Jesus Christ. Amen. So I've got a, a verse. If I, if I could have that up there, Bill, please. Yeah. And this is the one that's very important. Colossians chapter 2, verse 17 says to us that all these things, everything that was... Uh, in, this, in the sanctuary, from the time you walked into the sanctuary, the candle stand, the showbread, uh, the altar, and the uh, incense all pointed to Jesus Christ. And of course, um, the curtain uh, was the final thing that actually was torn down to show that there's no separation now between us and God, right? So all those things were symbol of Jesus Christ. And it's the same with the festivals, whether it's the Feast of Tabernacles, the Passover, and, and all the rest of them that we know of. They all pointed to Jesus and what he had done for Israel, physical Israel, right? So there's really no need. And I'll, and I'll let you decide in your own minds uh, whether it is necessary for us to carry on. Because like I said, Jesus... Um, uh, what, they were all pointed to Jesus, and this verse says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now this verse here that we find, and it's also in conjunction with that, in Matthew 24, verse 2. Um, I, can you all see that all right? Amen? Okay, good. This one says, and this is a, a, a piece of prophecy or a piece of scripture that is totally, totally misunderstood Uh, when Jesus said it. So Jesus was actually prophesying to his disciples because they came to him, remember, and they said, Lord, look at the temple. Isn't it beautiful? And it it would have been uh, beautiful in those those days. And then Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Powerful, isn't it? powerful jesus said it but why is it that the world does not understand that particular piece of scripture jesus says here and i think i can work this thing just here that there will there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down was jesus just saying that he was just talking about the temple at the time the temple in jerusalem which was destroyed 70 years afterwards? Was he just talking about that temple? No, this prophecy is an everlasting prophecy. Jesus said there will not be a stone left upon uh, another that shall not be thrown down. So what he's saying with that, he says the temple will not be rebuilt. Amen? And there's a reason why it uh, wasn't to be rebuilt. Because it all pointed to Jesus. It all pointed to Jesus, right? That whole physical worship that took place in Israel pointed to Jesus. So it's one of the greatest misunderstood um, passages of Scripture that uh, that the the Christian world just does not understand. And of course, um, I think it's on my next one. Hang on, I'll just check that. Yeah. Hal Hal Lindsay uh, is one of the authors of the of the book, The Great planet earth or um and, and another particular one i just can't remember the name of it and it all points about this whole thing about the temple the physical temple in jerusalem to, to be rebuilt in the battle of armageddon the battle of armageddon as he explains it is that um israel will again um, rebuild the temple um the uh, the people in that area will all come and destroy it and then then it's all over but that's not what scripture is talking about and he's absolutely sold millions of copies of this particular book he had a lot of prophecies in saying that um that uh, that a lot of this would happen in 1981 and of course it hasn't happened 
And yet a lot of the ecumenical evangelical Christians are still holding on to this belief. And I love what Doug Batchelor uh, uh, refers to it as. He calls it a styro, uh, styro, uh, polystyrene monument which has no uh, biblical or prophetical substance. And it hasn't, right? But so many people out there are misled by this, this truth that the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt. And of course, with that, America is pumping huge amount of money into, into Israel uh, with that same misunderstanding. But the scripture says, no, it is not going to be rebuilt. And the reason, because I'll explain it to you. This one, this particular verse says in Luke 17, 20, 21, that the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. As Jesus came the first time, what were the people of the time expecting Jesus to do? They were expecting him to free them from the Roman rulers, right? So again, it was all on a physical level. But whenever Jesus is talking about this, he refers to it, he takes it to the, a spiritual level, right? Okay, so just then, back then, as they were expecting Jesus and his disciples were also at fault with this, they were expecting Jesus to free them from the Roman rule and, uh, and set up his kingdom here on earth as an as a earthly, uh, earthly king and that they, they too could have dominion and rule from Jerusalem. But it says, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, or here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And there's another verse, I just couldn't remember where it was, where it says that the kingdom of God starts, starts within us too, just to substantiate that particular verse. And here, in this particular verse here, in Genesis chapter 32, uh, verse 28, we have the actual first reference to the word or to the name Israel. Okay? And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. This came about when uh, Jacob had a fight all night with the, uh, with the angel of God. And uh, as he came closer to the morning and the angel wanted to go, um, Jacob wouldn't let him go. And he said he, until he asked him to tell him his name. And then he gave uh, Jacob this new name, Israel. And there's an importance here in this particular, this particular last, pa last piece of, the la of this uh, passage or this verse. It says, For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. That particular physical fight that uh, Jacob had uh, with the angel, he prevailed, but more so that he had, um, it has more of a spiritual uh, connotation to that particular text. Um, because when we look at that particular text there, it also refers to, it has a dual application and it also refers to Jesus being the prince that has power with God and with men and has, prevailed, and has prevailed because Jesus said, all power has been given to me on earth and in heaven. You'll see that uh, crystallize as, as we go along. And, if, and it was here too, naturally, that even though Jacob is now called Israel, his sons then become, the 12 sons of Jacob, then become the foundational members of the actual, um, what would you call it? The, not the city, but the nation, the nation of Israel. And then they, of course, then go into, get, uh, into captivity into Egypt as, as slaves. Here we have just another little comparison just to see the difference between the physical Israel and the spiritual Israel. And, oops, sorry. In this particular verse here in Genesis, there was a man named Joseph who has dreams and goes into Egypt to preserve his family. Genesis 45, 5. This is the son of Jacob, right? The one who had the dreams told his brothers that one day they would worship him and, and uh, they said, oh, no, we won't. But of course, as we know from Scripture, it all came, to, came true. So here's this Joseph. He gets sold into slavery and then ends up becoming the prime minister of Egypt. And by, by going into that position, he's able to be in a position to save his family and the nation of Egypt. All right. In uh, Matthew, though, Matthew 2.13, we also have another reference to another Joseph. In Mat Matthew, another Joseph also has dreams and goes into Egypt to preserve his family. 
This Joseph is uh, the husband of Mary, the stepfather of Jesus, right? And he has a dream at night uh, by an angel where he says it's time to go to leave uh, to leave uh, Israel to go into into Egypt because Herod is trying will try and kill your son. Amazing these two these two parallels. One of course this one here referring to to Jesus um, Jesus' parents have, having to flee into Egypt into the wilderness of Egypt and and Joseph um, say preserved his family by doing the doing the same thing and it of course it qualifies the other text that I have out of Egypt I have called my son or in this particular case my sons <clears throat> here we have uh, in um, Matthew chapter 2 verse 15 uh, sorry in Hosea 11 verse 1 in the Old Testament it says when Israel was a child then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt all right, so here we have the reference, scriptural reference in Hosea that Israel was classed by God the Father as his child, okay? His child whom he loved, and he called his son out of Egypt. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, we have another similar verse, and it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So as we saw in the, uh, in the first reference, Joseph having dreams, going into Egypt, preserving the, the, his family, and also Joseph, the um, son, the uh, husband of Mary, also doing the same thing. And it's interesting to note that um, Israel is the son of God, as Jesus is also the son of God. So I hope you can just uh, keep up with me in regards to these comparisons. In there, this one's a bit faint, sorry about that. But in this particular verse here, again, it just, con just uh, substantiates what physical Israel went through in regards to a comparison to what Jesus went through as spiritual Israel. So here we have it in First uh, Corinthians 10, um, chapter 10, verse 2. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not have you, sh you should be ignorant. And I love that verse. Paul refers to that in Thelos Thessalonians also. In other words, I want you to know what I'm talking about here how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. This, uh, as we know, Egypt has been um, brought out of, uh, sorry, Israel has been brought out of Egypt and they come to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea and they're allowed to go through the, through the Red Sea and this is referred to them as the baptism of Moses represented here by the waters of the Red Sea and of course the cloud at night uh, I'll just read, read oh, sorry I'll re -re read that where it says and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea the cloud of course we know who that represented who was hiding in the cloud or covered uh, because of the cloud and that's God himself all did eat the same spiritual meat, same spiritual meat, which was the quail and the manna, and all did drink the same spiritual drink. That water that flowed came out of the rock that Moses spoke to and the one that um, um, Moses smote the second time. For they drank of that spiritual rock, and we know that's why Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land because he didn't obey what God had told him. He didn't speak to the rock. He, uh, he hit it. And that's, of course, representing Jesus Christ. And they followed him, and that rock was Christ. So as, just as we saw, we see that Israel of old, the physical Israel, was baptized through the Red Sea. We have also the reference to Jesus as being spiritual Israel. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight away up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew three fifteen to 17. Important to note that Jesus was baptized as spiritual Israel, and also physical Israel was also had went through that process of, of, uh, of a baptism through the Red Sea. This is important, though, what happens after both of them, after they've, they've been through that experience. And it's the number 40. And of course, we all know that in Scripture, when we refer to the number 40, it's referring to the time of, of preparation. 
Okay, Moses went through three periods of 40, 40 years in Egypt uh, to learn uh, the way of the Egyptians, 40 years in the desert of Midian preparing for his, uh, for his um, uh, job of delivering the Israelites and, of course, 40 years delivering them. So he had three times of preparation. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards a hungered. After passing through the Red Sea, physical Israel spent 40 years in the desert. 40 years in the desert. Okay, we know that they could have gone straight across, but they didn't. They had to spend 40 years in the desert, pre preparing themselves, preparing a nation to go and inherit the, uh, the, the, um, the promised land. And of course, Jesus also spent 40 days and 40 nights in the, in the wilderness, just like uh, the Israelites did, but his job was in preparation for his ministry uh, on earth. Amazing, eh? The, the comparisons and the parallels between the physical Israel and spiritual Israel. Now we're getting a bit closer to, uh, to our or to substantiate what I'm saying here in regards to Israel. And it says, But thou, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, But thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, who I have chosen the seed of Abraham, my friend. Again, But thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, who I have chosen the seed of Abraham, my friend. So here we have a, um, a qualification that Israel is God's servant, Jacob originally, whom I have chosen, God chose him, right? And I am, the, and sorry, the seed of Abraham, my friend. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Jesus Christ. So it's not plural in this sense, it's singular. And it's referring to the promise being given to Abraham, and uh, which is um, Abraham is representing Israel again, a leader of Israel. And of course, here we have Jesus Christ, who is the true, the true seed. And of course, it goes on as that uh, in regards to that seed. In uh, the book of Galatians, continuing chapter three, verse twenty-nine: For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and is according to the promise. In God's kingdom, and you know, when we just look, look uh, here at our congregation, we're of all different nationalities here today, and, uh, th but that doesn't matter. In God's family, we are all children of God, all seeds according to the promise of Christ. If you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and is according to the promise. So that promise was not just only uh, for physical Israel. You didn't have to be a Jew to inherit that. That physical has passed away. We're now in a spiritual realm through Jesus Christ. Amen. Also remaining in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, uh, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. First the seed of Abraham, now the faith of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all nations will be blessed. So then those who are of the faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So it's important, isn't it, to be part of the promise of God is to have that same faith that Abraham had. And of course, we know that Abraham had an enormous faith because when God called him out of the land of Ur, he just up and went. And we all are being called in a similar manner too. When God calls us, we are to leave everything and to accept, uh, everything, to accept this wonderful gift of salvation. And of course, in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 11, we have the other reference that, uh, in regards to um, 
Abraham, if we could just actually turn to that. Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 11 and reading from verse 8. We have, this is what we call um, the faith chapter. And it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive it for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out no, not knowing whether he went by faith. You know, faith requires from us to have complete trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Complete trust. And, of course, we have another example which Jesus referred to. Remember when the blind man came to Jesus and asked um, Jesus to heal him in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Powerful verse here in reference to Jesus says, I have found no so I have found, sorry, not so great a faith in all of Israel. Here he is in physical Israel. He's found this faith of who? The blind man, a Gentile person, right? And I say unto you that any man shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't matter because these people have passed away. It doesn't matter the history of them now, but one day we will have the opportunity to sit down with him in heaven uh, with these wonderful men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their day is coming soon, and uh, it's time to get ready. In regards to the temple in the book of uh, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, it says, let, nam, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the verse why a lot of Christians today think that the temple has to be rebuilt because of that verse there. Um, sorry, I've got my thing here. So that as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So because this, what it's referring to, of course, as we all know, is referring to the Antichrist, okay? And it says that so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God. Just because of that little verse, they think that Israel needs to have the temple rebuilt. But we know that that is referring to, um, to the Antichrist sitting as God in the temple, um, who opposes and exalted himself all above all that is called God, all that is worshipped. Amazing, isn't it, how people get things out of context and uh, have so many people and so many books published uh, in regards to those, those little verses just because... They've misunderstood uh, prophecy. First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 11 to 12. And it shall come to pass when the, thy days be expired that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. This, of course, is referring to uh, King David. King David was asking of the Lord if he could build him a house, and he says, no. He said, it's going to be your son, um, your sons uh, that will, um, will build me a, a house to worship in. And because this one, this particular verse also has a, has a, phys has a dual application in regards to, um, sorry, oh, can we go back on that one, Bill, please? I want to play there, sorry. I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, a dual application because this is, um, this is referring to uh, Solomon rebuilding the temple of God, right? But there's a little verse here that will say, I will he, um, he shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. And of course, this is not talking about Solomon anymore because Solomon's passed on, King David's passed on. So this has, a, has a, uh, a spiritual application in that he shall build me a house referring to Jesus and that his throne will be forever. Okay. John 2, uh, chapter 19 to 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. It was this particular verse that actually caused a lot of people to fall away from following Jesus. Because, again, they were looking at the horizontal, not the vertical, understanding that uh, um, that temple took just over 40 um, more years, 46 years to build. But, of course, Jesus was trying to, trying to get their minds away from the physical and off the spiritual, saying, it's now me, you know, um, it's the temple. And, of course, our temple is, is, um, is our body, just like uh, Jesus is explaining it here. Of course, he spoke of the temple of his body and in three days he raised it up and referring to we have uh, two uh, two references here in jeremiah 31 31 it says behold the days come says the lord and i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah we had a verse in our in our sabbath school this morning so just as he said to physical israel he said i will make a covenant uh, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's amazing how we have a parallel in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, reading from verses 8 to 10. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put their laws into their mind. Sorry, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. We are the people of God because we have accepted that, this, that God has written his laws in our hearts and in our minds. That is the new covenant that, Israel, that God has made with us with us as spiritual Israel. The first covenant, God kept, but Israel didn't keep it. So even now, we should learn from their mistakes, shouldn't we? And that we should keep this covenant that God has made with us by writing his laws in our minds and our, our hearts as we make decisions every day for Christ, we make them in accordance to his will, accordance to his law. And because I love God so much, I don't want to break his commandments because, again, it's written on my heart, the seat of all emotion. So the covenant that God has made is with all Jews, physical and spiritual. Just like the Israel, the Jews of old will be saved, so will spiritual Israel. There's no need to worry about uh, the temple re being rebuilt, there's no need to worry about sending funds to help rebuild the temple in Israel. The only funds we need to send to Israel is to build our schools and to help build our churches and to support Adra in that war and torn countries of the Middle East. All right, And of course, um, just to help people understand that all Jews will be saved, spiritual Jews. We are neither Greek nor Jews, we are free in Jesus Christ. New creatures, new creatures in Jesus Christ created for the purpose of inhabiting the heavenly kingdom. So I hope that's helped you have a better understanding of, uh, of what when people come to you and say that it's necessary to, to keep uh, the festivals or it's necessary to do this or that. No, it's not. God was talking about, Jesus was talking about the physical with the spiritual aspect of the temple of God. We don't need that anymore. Amen. God bless you all.
Heavenly Father, we thank you again for Jesus, Lord. We thank you for the truths of the gospel that you have given us, Lord, and through your spirit we can understand them clearly, Lord. Give us the time that we need, Lord, to spend more time in study of your word, and especially as we go into a new quarter, Lord, to study our new Sabbath school lesson. Um, may we just prayerfully uh, be able to study your word as we go into this new week. Lord, help us to cleft to you on a daily basis even more so. As we see the time approaching, Lord, help us to be bold in our witness. And Lord, we just thank you again for the outpouring of your spirit upon us, upon our families and friends. Lord, as we go through this new week, we don't want to go by ourselves. We want to go with you, Lord, and that your spirit will go before us as we give you thanks and praise you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.